The book of Obadiah concludes with the following phrase, the kingdom will be the Lord's. And in the context, of course, of Obadiah, we're talking about the Edomites and how they have transgressed against God's will, which, by the way, is an interesting comment with regard to those who would try to escape jurisdiction somehow by saying, I don't uh, worship God, I don't follow after God, and therefore God's rules don't apply to me. They apply to the Edomites, and the Edomites were destroyed as a nation because of their rebellion against God. But the, the terminology is interesting. The kingdom will be the Lord's. The suggestion is not that God is not ruling, but one of these days is going to get around to ruling. It's more a matter of perception. It will become obvious that the kingdom will be the Lord's. God's ruling no matter what, but there are times when it doesn't look like he's ruling. The Edomites received this promise, and, and really more to the point, the Israelites received the promise that the Edomites are going to be held accountable for their actions in due course of time. But uh, due course of time is kind of a, a tricky prospect when you think about it. Uh, scholars are very much split with regard to Obadiah and when it's being written. At the most conservative end of it, though, the Edomites survived another six centuries before completely disappearing from the map. And it very well could be another three centuries longer than that. They were more or less gone by the time Jesus is in the flesh on the scene there in Jerusalem. But if you take Jesus at his literal word, or if you take uh, Obadiah, that is, at his literal word, if you're looking for a complete obliteration of the Edomites, which I'm not sure the text requires, by the way, but nevertheless, if you're thinking that the Edomites are going to be completely and totally destroyed, that might have taken a thousand years for God to do that. And I don't know how many times you're willing to wait a thousand years for some kind of satisfaction or gratification, etc. I'm not willing. I, I want a king who shows up. I want to have some kind of reasonable time frame, and I get to define what reasonable is. And the fact of the matter is, absentee government is pretty close to the only thing that we deal with on an ongoing basis. I'm not really talking about God here either. If I run into a pothole in my neighborhood, I am tempted to look around and see if I can find a county commissioner to whine at, uh, but I don't find one. That's just not the way government operates. And God's government, of course, is, is beyond enormous. God's government is everything. And so just from a practical standpoint, it just doesn't seem very reasonable for me to expect God to just kind of jump when I say jump, as it were. And nevertheless, despite that, we have this expectation that things are going to be done the way that we want them done. And if they are not done that way, then we reserve the right to whine about it. And we very well may rebel against it, join the other team, as it were. Well, I'm here today to encourage you to read Obadiah and read the promises of God and remind yourself what the Bible consistently says. And that is that this so-called absentee king of ours, this king who does not seem to be present for us when we really want him, as it were, that he is absolutely present with us and that he is the one that we need to continue to rely on, that we need to continue to trust in. Now, for whatever reason, and, and maybe there's some rationalizations we can come up with with regard to this, but let's, let's grasp reality here uh, to begin with. Realize that serving God in this life is going to be frustrating from time to time. Uh, if you want to go visit the governor, you may have to wait in line. Well, you have an entire planet full of people who are waiting to see God. And I realize that God doesn't have to have people wait in line. He can do more than one thing at the same time, etc. But still the basic principle applies that just because we want God to show up at any given time for any given problem, that does not necessarily mean that he's going to do that or that we should have any expectation that he's going to do that. Many, many times we'll be in David's position, uh, reading from Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you abandoned me? Why are you so far from my deliverance and from uh, my words of groaning? My God, I cry by day, but you do not answer by night, yet I have no rest. And, and I'm aware that this passage is quoted by Jesus on the cross, and I don't want to get into a big discussion about how that passage applies to Jesus and the words that he says there about being forsaken by God. We'll save that for another time. From David's perspective, as he's writing this, this text down here, 
he is voicing the concerns and the frustrations of a true believer, someone who really does believe in God, who continues to cry out to God. But God seems for all appearances to have no interest in David. He is absolutely ignoring David. Now, I think that there's some poetic language here and that there's some license that, that David, the writer, is using. I, I don't think that even in his weakest moments, David actually thought God had abandoned him. Nevertheless, it feels that way. And we may actually let that slip every once in a while, like David does here. I mean, what's the point in serving God and being a child of God, sacrificing as we do, worshiping as we do? The assumption is that God's going to be there for us. So why isn't he? Well, I don't have a full answer for that, but I will caution you with regard to generalities here that our relationship with God does not necessarily mean he is going to jump when we say jump. And when we think about it, that kind of makes sense, doesn't it? I mean, why would we have any kind of pull with God? Which one is the master and which one's the servant after all? If we are servants of the Lord, then we're going to behave like the important widow does in Luke chapter 18, who goes to the judge over and over and over again because he is the proper authority. He's the one who is responsible for dealing with the problems in her life and whether it gets resolved immediately or not, to her satisfaction or not, this is still the proper process. This is what she is going to do. And the text says there gives us assurance that this continued process of ours is going to yield results, that she's going to get what she asks for in the end. And uh, again, not to just overmake the point here with regard to specifics, we're not suggesting here, Jesus isn't suggesting that if you fuss and fuss and fuss and fuss and fuss, that eventually, you may have to wait a couple of years, but eventually God's going to get around to doing what he tells you to do, what you tell him to do rather. Uh, it doesn't work that way. What we are going to get from God is a proper redress of our general grievances. The issues that we have in life, not about a particular noisy neighbor and his particular you know, habits with regard to his grass or his noise or you know, whatever, that, that's not the issue. The issue is the inequity of life. The issue is sin. The issue is bad people getting away with it. We are given general assurances that our team is going to win because this is God's team and their team is going to lose. How exactly that works out is not necessarily for our understanding right now. What we should take assurance in is the fact that he will come in his time and in his way. But kind of touching on that same subject with regard to God's behavior, sometimes when we have the thing that we are asking him for, and maybe it's a good thing, maybe it is a very noble or even spiritual thing that we're asking for. I personally think that's what Paul is praying about in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, where he is asking for this thorn in the flesh to be removed. I don't think it is merely a physical malady. You may or may not agree with me on this, but I think this is a struggle that is directly impeding his ability to serve Jesus, at least as he sees it. And the answer is no, you cannot get it. Sometimes the important widow goes back to the judge over and over and over and over again, or three times in the case of Paul here with his thorn in the flesh. And there is a final answer. The answer is no. Now, does that mean that God doesn't love us? Does that mean that God is incapable of responding to us? No, of course not. It simply means that sometimes God's answer is not what we are expecting. That doesn't mean God doesn't rule, and that doesn't mean that we are just in rebelling against him and going out and finding some other God or, or whatever. No, it's simply reminding us of the nature of his wisdom versus our wisdom, his judgment versus our judgment. It seems in the wisdom of God, not to just generalize too much here, but that my long-term spiritual purposes or God's long-term general purposes for mankind, etc., seems to be better served in this other area than the area that I would have preferred, that I would have understood, that I would have pursued if I had been God. Well, I'm not God. I'm not going to be God. And I'm okay with that. I want that to be the case. I want to serve a God that's wiser and more powerful than me. That's, that's kind of the whole point of serving God after all. If that's going to be the case, though, then I have to be prepared to receive a no. I know there are many, many passages in the text that seem on the surface to imply that the answer is always going to be yes. Ask and you shall receive, seek and you shall find, etc. But in the broader picture of prayer, in the broader picture of our relationship with God, I think we come to realize it's not 
a matter of us asking and God saying, well, yes, of course, you're my child. I'm going to give you exactly what you want. It's pursuing the will of God, and it's us asking for the will of God to be pursued in our life. I think that's what the prayer, thy kingdom come, in the Lord's Prayer is talking about there. I'm wanting God's will to be accomplished in my life in the same way that it's accomplished in heavenly realms. I don't understand how that works. I don't understand what form that should take or might take or will take. But I don't have to because I can pray for God to rule in my life. I can pray for God's will to be done in my life and have confidence that that is going to happen. I've put that wheel in motion already by simply saying thy kingdom come. And that means I don't have to get the answer that I want. It'd be nice if I did. But I don't have to get that answer for my faith to be justified, vindicated in my own in my own mind. I can have confidence that God does know my issues. He does know my problems, that he is reigning in heaven and that I am better off because he is. There's uh, also a couple of minutes uh, here to talk about the, the very idea of asking for some kind of rationalization. I, I know that people mean well sometimes. I'm not trying to paint with too broad a, a brush here. But when things go badly for us, your child dies or you lose your job or your marriage goes south or whatever it happens to be, we are oftentimes trained to look for some kind of rationalization. If this is the will of God that this happened, well, there must be some reason for it to have happened. And, and I'm not going to argue with that. I'm not going to get too deep into the mind of God here. But I encourage other people not to do that either. Because usually, or at least lots of times, when people say there must be a reason, what they mean is there must be a specific reason. I must have a specific lesson that I'm supposed to take out of this. I'm supposed to grow in this particular way or do this particular thing or abandon this particular project or whatever it happens to be. I, I want some kind of specific message that I'm getting for God, from God so I can accept it and embrace it. And, and then after having done that, after God gives me this concrete reason why all of these things happen the way they did, then I can get back to the task of serving God. And that's just not the way this works. I'm not suggesting God doesn't have a specific lesson for you with regard to whatever issue you're wrestling with. I don't know. I couldn't possibly know, and neither could you. That's the whole point. Maybe it's a mistake for us to be digging too deep into this process in the first place. Job does nothing but ask questions for the vast majority of the book of Job, and, and God finally gets you know, ready to talk back to him in chapter 38, verses 1 through 3, verse chapter 40 again, verse number 1 and 2. And there are no answers to be found here. You can read those chapters till you're, you know, you go blind. And you'll never find God saying, this is why you're going through everything that you're going through. Now, as it turns out, there is a reason. But he never gives it to Job, not in the context of the, of the text anyway. He's simply asked to wake up every day and honor God, serve God, believe in God, trust in God. That's difficult sometimes, especially when you lose all your children, you lose all your possessions, and your wife is, is nagging you, and your friends are making things worse. And, and it can be very difficult to count on God, to trust in God, to believe that God is reigning in heaven. Because God's reign looks nothing like what we would expect it to look like. Well, you know what? It's going to happen that way sometimes. And sometimes God will give you an answer, and sometimes he won't. Ultimately, it's not about whether we got the answer we were looking for, whether we got the message that God was trying to send to us if there happens to have been such a message in the first place. The point is, at least in a general sense, this is the point. Are we going to trust in God? Going back to the very beginning of Job, right? The accusation hurled against him from the beginning. Does Job serve God for nothing? Is Job serving God because it's the right thing to do or because he gets a lot of stuff out of it because his life is so much better this way? That's the question that we answer ourselves, uh, that we should be asking ourselves. This is the nature of temptation. Does Hal serve God for nothing? Am I willing to continue to show up and please God and do the best I can in his service when there doesn't seem to be any short-term reason for me to do that? I, I emphasize also that this trust, this confidence that we place in God eventually will pay off. And I don't want to to push this point too much with regard to specific things, but at least in general uh, senses, God is in control of the world and he will manifest his rule 
in due course of time. Now, maybe not in your way, maybe certainly not in your time or probably not in your time, but he will do it, such as the case for all of mankind. And I think that's the main point that he's getting at here in 2 Peter chapter 3. In verse number 8, we read, Dear friends, don't overlook this one fact. With the Lord, one day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like one day. The Lord does not delay his promise, as some, uh, some understand delay, but is patient with you, not wanting any, should per uh, any to perish, but all to come to repentance. Then going through verse 10, But the day of the Lord will come, like a thief. On that day, the heavens will pass away with a loud noise. The elements will burn and be dissolved, and the earth and its works on it will be disclosed. God will show up eventually. And, and I'm going to do a big end time discussion here. But the point is that time doesn't mean to you the same that it means to God. The day is to the Lord is a thousand years. That means God doesn't know the difference. Obviously, God knows the difference. But he's not getting impatient with the world in the same sense that you and I would get impatient with the world. He's not willing that any should perish. He wants to continue to give us chance after chance to come back to him, to allow him to have his way in our lives and perhaps have other people have the same uh, transformation experience. That would be a wonderful thing. And God is willing to wait. How long? I don't know. I don't know there's any way of determining how long. There's been any number of attempts over the years to try to put some kind of calendar on God. And that's just not the way I read this text or any other end time texts. I don't think that God runs out of patience in the same way that you and I do. The point here is that in the end, whenever the end is, whatever he may conceive the end to be, goodness will win out and righteousness will win out and evil is going to be punished. The things that you did in this life in his service will be vindicated, will be honored by God. So while you're waiting for the king to show up, while you're waiting for, for good things to happen instead of all these bad things that are happening, I urge you to continue to call on the Lord. It's uh, I, I know that that may seem like rather circular logic. I've spent most of the time here talking about how calling on the Lord for salvation is, uh, is not going to get you what you want, or at least very well may not get what you want. But you call anyway. Because in the big picture, it's not about what God does or does not do in the next five minutes or the next five years or the next five decades even, but what he is going to do with us in judgment. And that's why we continue to press on. We continue to be the important widow, continue to go to God in prayer. That's James's point in a what's probably a more specific context in his day, but it applies to us as well. Verse number seven in chapter five, therefore, brothers and sisters, be patient until the Lord's coming. See how the farmer waits for the precious fruit of the earth and is patient with it until it receives the early and the late rains. You must, uh, you also must be patient. Strengthen your hearts because the Lord's coming is near. I, I thought about this, pass this passage a little bit this week while we were getting a little bit of rain. And uh, it can be frustrating in, in Central Texas anyway during the summer waiting for the rain to show up. But the rain will show up. Maybe on your timetable, maybe not on your timetable. But nevertheless, the Lord does come around in due course of time. And the uh, the early and the late rains are reminders for us of his love and, and mercy and consistency and his truthfulness that he will, in fact, that he does, in fact, honor the promises that he makes to us. The kingdom will be the Lord's. And maybe you're going through some kind of frustrating experience right now and you're not quite sure when God's ever going to show up. I can't give you an answer beyond what you already know beyond what the Lord has told us here. I, I don't know your specific situation. If I did know your specific situation, I still wouldn't have an answer. Except for this, God knows you. God knows who you are and what you're going through. And if you put your trust in him, if you put your confidence in him, then all will be well with you in time. Or maybe outside of time. Maybe it won't even get worked out in time. But eventually, if faith that is placed in God in his judgment as king of kings is going to be vindicated. That's why we come to Jesus and accept him as Lord, because we trust that our lives are safe in his hands. And if you have made that commitment, I urge you to continue in that commitment and deepen that commitment and increase your loyalty to your Lord and the Savior so that one day you will be welcomed into heavenly realms and all of the faith that you placed in him in this life will be honored and vindicated. Thank you so much for studying along. I hope that this is a blessing to you. I hope that you continue to serve the King of Kings and trust in his care and, prov uh, and providence and, and uh, providence, that is, 
and his willingness and eagerness to come to the rescue of his people, no matter how long it may take. Thank you very much. God bless.